In the past week, how many of you have dealt with side effects, whether counseling a patient on a new drug or trying to count how many pages are coming out of the printer for your Prozac handout, and then trying so carefully to fold it and stuff it into your patient's bag? Or maybe you've been experiencing side effects yourself. How many have had to deal with side effects in any way? It affects us all as pharmacists and technicians. We've been trained to identify them. And today we will talk about how to deal with them naturally. I am so passionate about this topic that I started a business about side effects. And although I do have a business, it should have no bearing upon our, the content of our presentation today. Today we are going to dive deep into a patient case. We will talk about nutrient depletion, we will talk about side effects, and which kinds of side effects can be dealt with in a natural way. And we will find out what kind of resource modalities we can use to find good information for how to deal with side effects. So, our case today. This is a young mother. She walks into her grocery store pharmacy right before closing. She looks haggard from having been taking two antibiotics in the last two weeks. She has this rash that suddenly appeared, suspiciously, looking like this on her chest. Little tiny red flat dots all over. She says she has a million of them across her chest. You can't see them all, but they're there. And she is concerned. She asks you what she should take. And you think, well, what should I suggest? I remember two weeks ago, I dispensed dicloxacillin, which is the first line treatment for mastitis. She's had one breast infection, and then a week later, her prescriber calls you and says, she's allergic to sulfa, and she's already failed the first line treatment. What do you suggest as an alternative second line treatment for mastitis, because it's back? She's got a horribly high fever, and she's moaning and groaning in bed at home. What do you suggest as a pharmacist? And so you suggested Cipro, and she took that faithfully for a week. And now she has the suspicious rash. What do you do? Which answer? I'd like you all to get your audience response cards out, the colored papers, so that we can answer this. Did she, do you tell her to take the Benadryl cream? And, um, but the number one side effect of all prescription drugs is wallet depletion. So you obviously, want to give her the generic option. So you say diphenhydramine cream, and you tell her to call her dermatologist in the morning. Or B, you tell her to take the Benadryl cream and stop taking her antibiotic. C is you tell her to take Tylenol PM, but you recommend the generic diphenhydramine and acetaminophen, and tell her to call her, the, her dermatologist in the morning. Or D, you tell her to stop taking the antibiotic and call her dermatologist in the morning. Please raise your audience response cards. Which one do you think? We will dive deep into which one it really is. We've got a guess. We've got a one, two answers. All right. We've got more answers. Thank you. We've got some responses. Now let's find out the real answer here. When you see this, this might change your answer. She's got that bruise-like looking thing on her leg, but you don't see that because she's fully dressed. And then she has that purplish lesion on her arm called purpura. She has ITP. You don't know that yet, but it's best for her to stop taking her antibiotic and call her dermatologist in the morning. We're gonna find out why not to use the other options in a second. So when she goes to her dermatology appointment, the dermatologist, a physician's assistant, sees this rash and it has spread all the way down her legs by this point. And he doesn't really know, is it the dicloxacillin or the Cipro? He looks in a whole bunch of literature, he can't figure it out. He calls in his supervising medical doctor and he's just as puzzled. They eventually take her blood draw of a CBC and send her on her way. So you stop taking those antibiotics. She stops taking them and they call her two hours later your platelet level was only 12 out of 150 to 400. Basically, off the charts low. You have no platelets. You need to call your primary care doctor. She calls her primary care doctor, and they say, actually, there's nothing we can do for you when you have a platelet level that low. You need to go straight to the emergency room. So she goes straight to the emergency room. They draw her blood again. She has 
3,000 platelets per microliter. That's basically nothing. If she got hit by a car on the way to the emergency room, she would have died because she can't clot at all. After a series of tests, they diagnose her with ITP, and they prescribe one milligram per kilogram of prednisone, which was 60 milligrams in this case. That's a very high dose. Normal therapeutic level is two and a half milligrams. So what is ITP? It used to be called idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura because of that purplish lesion, but now they've changed the name because it's not idiopathic. It's immune mediated. So they call it immune thrombocytopenia. They just changed which letter stands for which a part of the acronym. Let's find out from the expert on all things medical, Dr. Z Dog, MD. Pay attention to what he says about prednisone. Blame it all on my labs, these bruises and scabs. Is it normal to bleed when I floss? I was the last one to know what my CBC showed. Why does my stool look like barbecue sauce? Ain't got no PCP, so I checked WebMD And I nearly stroked out as I read So I went online and Googled others to find The support group instead Now I got friends with low platelets Where the nosebleeds flow And prednisone chases my bruise away is my spleen okay? Oh, I'm not big on thrombopoiesis Think I'll skip on down to plasmapheresis Cause I got friends with low platelets Thanks, Z-Dog. So when I was preparing this, I wanted to give you a list of the most commonly experienced side effects of prednisone. I had a really hard time doing that because prednisone was approved back in 1955 before the FDA required studies on side effects and how often they are. So a drug approved more recently would say 10% of patients have nausea, 20% had GI upset and we'd have a great list of what to tell our patients to expect. But prednisone's not like that. We don't have a great list. And so I, I checked clinical pharmacology, I checked micromedics, I checked Lexicomp, and they had 142 separate terms that listed all the possibilities of what could be experienced by a patient on prednisone. Since a lot of those were duplicative, I grouped them into 95. So for example, the fat redistribution, the buffalo hump, the truncal obesity, and the moon face that Z-Dog showed us, all of those are fat abnormalities. So when we group all of those terms together, there are still 95 separate miserable experiences your prednisone patients can have. If they had consistent data, and if there was consistent data available, there would not be a Venn diagram here. This would be one circle and every single drug reference would contain the same information, but they don't. As you can see, there are only eight side effects listed by every single drug reference. The rest are inconsistent. 
So clinical pharmacology by far has the most. They have 16 that nobody else even lists. And the other drug references overlap in different ways. The moral of the story here is we don't really know which is the most commonly experienced side effect. We know which is the most frequently reported in the drug literature, those eight, but we don't know if those are actually most commonly experienced. So I had to look up patient surveys, not the greatest source of data, but that's all there is right now. And these are the most commonly experienced side effects. So the Cushing syndrome, the moon face, that round misery, fluid retention. Prednisone is a mineralocorticoid drug, and so it affects the sodium balance. And so there's extra sodium being retained that causes fluid retention, the moon face, and, and weight gain. The osteoporosis is because prednisone is leaching the bones of that vital nutrient to keep our bones strong. Uh, insomnia is a miserable side effect that we will be talking about next, and it is caused because prednisone mimics our fight or flight hormone. Now, when we need that fight or flight hormone to run away from the tiger, we don't wanna fall asleep, right? We don't want it to catch up with us and get eaten. But when we are just trying to live our lives with ITP, there is not a good reason to have insomnia. Along with that is the emotional lability. That means ups and downs of emotions. They're euphoric and have all the energy in the world, and then suddenly they crash and they're depressed and anxious and have violent outbursts of emotion that are uncontrollable because it's, their fight or flight hormone is hijacking their ability to inhibit that really strong emotion. Carbohydrate intolerance is again back to the fight or flight. When we need to run, we need a lot of energy. So the food that's being consumed is being sent straight to the bloodstream as sugar. And it's floating around in there causing hyperglycemia. And when there's that much sugar floating around and it's not being used to run away from tigers, it causes weight gain. And they're also very hungry. The next section of side effects are chronic. So if somebody is on prednisone for a long time, they might experience these. But if they're only on prednisone for a case of pneumonia, they're not likely to experience these or they're just not a big concern. So we're talking about hypertension, myopathy. So their bones are falling apart, their muscles are falling apart. They, their backbone can be compressed and they can get fractures that are even undetectable by an x-ray. You, you need like an MRI or a CT scan to detect them. Ulcers, prednisone's pretty hard on the stomach. And we always put that cute little sticker on that says take with food. But there's actually no evidence that taking prednisone with food makes any difference in whether it's going to prevent an ulcer or not. So it's just an unfortunate consequence. Then growth suppression. This obviously only happens in children since all of us adults are done growing. But if a child is on high doses of steroids, then it's possible that they might not grow as tall. And then the next two are eye complications, cataracts and glaucoma. These are more of a concern in our older population because they're already more prone to these and it might accelerate what is already in the works. And last of all, impaired wound healing. So for our patient today, she not only has a bleeding disorder and having a hard time clotting, but now she's having a hard time healing the wounds. Not a great combination. Now we're gonna talk about the dangerous or rare and quite possibly the most frequently reported in the literature, even though they don't make any sense, but they're all on nearly all of those drug references. So exophthalmos, that's the bulging eyes. And then pancreatitis, Super uncommon, but in almost every single literature. Aseptic necrosis of the bones. That's another complication of the osteoporosis. A pneumocystis gerovici infection. That's an opportunistic infection because prednisone is an immunosuppressant. And the only people who get a PCP infection are people with HIV or are on transplant and other immunosuppressives that are causing their, an opportunistic infection like this to happen. And surprisingly, even though it's mimicking the opposite, it, people can get anaphylaxis to prednisone. Here's a visual image to take all of that information I just showed you and put it all into one piece. So a person who was normally well fit suddenly has truncal obesity, a buffalo hump, thin arms and legs. They can't tell, but their bones are thinning 
and their face is getting rounded, might be turning red, they might be getting striae, stretch marks. It's just miserable. So she's on high dose prednisone. She can't sleep and she says, what should I do? So get your audience response cards ready. Should she A, take Tylenol to PM to, to help with the insomnia? Or B, should she take melatonin, 25 milligrams? Or C, should she take, should, should you suggest better sleep hygiene? Or D, you just say, well, sorry, prednisone causes that, maybe you should just stop taking it. Raise your cards. All right, we got a, a, a lot of C's and some B's. Let's find out why. So first we'll tackle that last one. That was a very uh, non-motivational interviewing statement. So let's talk about what would be a good response for her. First of all, we wanna always use open-ended questions. When we responded, oh, you should just stop taking it, they, we didn't even know why she was taking it. We didn't have any context for how bad the insomnia is. So we need to ask more information to find out the real answer. So a great question you can ask every single patient is how is this medication working for you? Because not only are you gonna find out their understanding of their condition itself, so you say, how is lisinopril working for you? And they're like, I don't know. Do they know why they're taking it? And you can follow up with, is, how is your blood pressure? And then the other side is you can find out if, when they respond, how is this medication working for you? Oh, it's causing the worst insomnia. So it can evoke either efficacy or safety information out of people. Next, when she says, oh, this insomnia is awful, and you show empathy, I know, isn't insomnia miserable? It's hard to be a happy, kind person when you can't sleep at night. Then you say, what have you tried to minimize side effects? In our case, she says, well, I stopped drinking caffeine after lunch. You say, that's a great idea. What else have you tried? And you try giving her the opportunity to come up with all of the ideas. Um, and if, if you know other suggestions, and we will get more in depth about what great ideas for helping with sleep are, you can say, that's a good idea to stop using caffeine. Is it okay if I share with you some other ideas? And then you've got her permission. You're not just lecturing from a podium. You're not just up there on your white tower. You are equal face to face trying to help them solve their problem. Then we ask what they think of that suggestion. So you say, well, actually, if you go to bed at a set time every night, that can really help with insomnia because your circadian rhythm can get acclimatized to that correct time to fall asleep. And she says, and you say, what do you think of that? And she said, well, I don't know. It's pretty hard for me to go to bed at the same time every night. And so after that, you verify readiness. So let's verify readiness. So for our patient, when you said, how likely are you to be able to go to bed at a set time every night? You can say, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you, are you, be able, are you going to be able to do this? On, if one is the least likely and 10 is the most likely. And she said, well, I'm at a four. And you said, what would it take to get, from, to, get to a 10? She said, well, you see, I've got this on Tuesday night and that on Thursday night, but maybe I could reschedule that or maybe I could get a really good sleep routine and make it not so hard to fall asleep at night. Great, what else could you try? You just keep getting her to answer for herself, to get her ideas for her own personal life. Then, um, if they're still resistant, you can say, what is your understanding of what would happen if you don't take your blood pressure medicine, or if you don't get enough sleep at night, or if you don't take the prednisone to treat your ITP? Then you can see if they really don't appreciate how important the drug is, or if they really do have an understanding and there are other issues at play. And then you can help them to weigh the benefits and the risks. So for this patient's case, when we would identify the risks and the benefits, you, she knows how awful the prednisone is. 
And she also knows that the alternative treatments are really just not great alternatives. She can either get a splenectomy, which is having her organ removed, or she can go on $40,000 chemotherapy on rituximab, or take pennies to the pill prednisone. It's a, it's a tough balance with all of those side effects. In addition, she's not able to decrease her dose of the prednisone. Every time they try to taper her down, her platelets crash. So her, if you see her, her chart, there's the platelet level and the prednisone dose. And they're, the exact, they're following the exact same traje trajectory. So what other drugs, can you counsel your patients in the same way? Which other drugs cause insomnia? One example is beta blockers. Beta blockers inhibit melatonin release in the body. And so they cause nightmares and other sleep issues. Alpha blockers, they affect the circadian rhythm as well. All of these drugs listed here in some way affect the sleep-wake cycle because of the pharmacology of the drug. Cholinesterase inhibitors, obviously they're blocking acetylcholine, but acetylcholine is used in some of our sleeping mechanisms. So it is hard to fall asleep when you're not able to release the correct hormones. This next group of drugs, they are, um, if they're taken at the correct time, then they don't cause insomnia. And so levothyroxine is a naturally occurring hormone that is released by our bodies in the morning. And if they're taken at night, it might potentially cause more wakefulness. ADHD stimulants are obviously stimulants. They're keeping people awake. If they are having issues falling asleep, then either the dose needs to be reduced, they need a different formulation, or maybe per, um, ha take it earlier in the day. The nicotine replacement therapy and Vreniclin Chantix both are stimulants and cause nightmares and things when taken too late in the day. Diuretics, here's a story for you. Back when I was doing MTM over the phone, I had a patient. And this patient was a nice little old man in Michigan. And he said, I've got this horrible insomnia. I wake up six or seven times a night to go to the bathroom. It's awful. And I said, that does sound awful. And I look through his medication list, furosemide. Lasix. He's on a diuretic. He is, and, and so I think, well, are, are you taking the Lasix? And he said, yes, because that's what he called it, not furosemide. And I said, when do you take the, the Lasix? And he said, just like my doctor told me, I take it twice a day, morning and at bedtime. I said, oh, well, I have a suggestion for you. And he said, what? I said, Lasix means it lasts six hours. It's going to make you need to go to the bathroom for six hours. And so if you take it at bedtime, the next six hours of bed, you're going to have to get up and go to the bathroom. And I said, I think what your doctor meant by twice a day was morning and at least six hours before bedtime, say 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. He said, really? Yes, that's the best way to do it. And he, he actually called us back and said, you have changed my life. I've taken off three medicines to help me sleep. And now I'm getting the restful sleep I need. Weight loss drugs are mostly stimulants that cause wakefulness and insomnia. Sudafed's a hard one because people are usually taking it because they have a cold or other forms of congestion, and they're taking it because they want to be able to sleep at night, potentially, and it, it can also cause stimulation. So it's a, it's a tough balance on that one. Non-prescription drugs that can affect sleep include the migraine medicines that contain caffeine and phenylephrine, and then the herbals, ginseng, um, ginkgo, garcinia, and St. John's wort. Natural Medicines Database is what we're going to focus on next. This is our objective number two. It is a really high quality drug reference, well, natural remedies reference, that they have thousands of studies backing up every suggestion. And in the Natural Medicines Database are a number of tools that we're going to explore today so that when you have a patient who loves all things natural, you can speak the same language and help really find them an evidence-based suggestion for how to treat their, their condition in a natural way. So first of all, we have the effectiveness checker. And in, in the effectiveness checker, you can type in a condition. So in this case, we type in thrombocytopenia. 
She has thrombocytopenia, and let's find out which remedies work for th thrombocytopenia. It will show that melatonin and berberine potentially help. Then we also can type in her side effects she's experiencing, the insomnia, and a whole list. You don't really need to be able to see what it all says right now. I just want you to see that there is a chart that appears and that it's tiered because I'm going to explain what that chart means. So first of all, we have the rating. So it has like, effective, likely effective, possibly effective, and then the opposite, possibly ineffective. So the effective, they're essentially FDA-approved drugs. Magnesium does work for constipation. We know that because it's FDA-approved for that. There are thousands of patients in the study, that's what the N stands for, and it's really high-quality data. The bias risk of the studies is quite low, and the outcomes are overwhelmingly positive. The data gets poorer quality as we go down, and stronger in the, um, the outcomes in the opposite direction. The last one is insufficient evidence. So this basically means we don't know if it works. There might be a case report or a case series, but there just isn't enough information to, to, to say whether it works or not. Maybe there's even conflicting information. Maybe there's a case report that says it does and a case report that says it doesn't. So you can suggest it, but it might not actually help at all. So back to our insomnia chart. You'll see on here several times melatonin. Other things that can help with sleep include uh, light therapy, music therapy, lemon balm. Those can all potentially help. Now to our sleep hygiene potential answer. So first of all, we have limit daytime naps. These are all patient counseling tips that you can use for somebody who might be experiencing insomnia. So to limit daytime naps, we need to have them to only be 30 minutes or shorter and earlier in the day, not right before bedtime. Next, we need to avoid stimulants. So this means caffeinated beverages or like the ADHD medications, especially closer to bedtime. Exercise is really important. It, it has two great benefits. First of all, it tires the body out so that it needs to fall. It feels more likely to fall asleep at night. And second, exercise that doesn't increase the heart rate, so yoga, stretching, breathing techniques, those can all help relax the body right before bedtime, as long as the heart rate doesn't increase. Then natural lighting. Again, this has two sides to it. First of all is exposure to morning sunlight. So if somebody's having issues with insomnia, if they go out right when the sun rises and get sunlight exposure to their eyes for at least 10 minutes, then that can really help to set their circadian rhythm, their clock, get it set in the right way so that their body knows that it's falling asleep time 12 hours later. That right now, this is wake time. This bright blue light is wake time. The other side of, of um, lighting is our, our phones. So our phones, our computer screens, our tablets, they all can emit blue lighting. Like I said, that's, that's sunrise lighting. We don't want to be telling our brain through the blue light that it's awaking time when we're doing computer work or Facebook or checking email right before bed because not only does that stimulate our emotional work ethic, but it also affects the blue light stimulation in our brain. And it, there's an option on phones these days to turn off the blue light at a certain time. So I suggest all of you do that and tell your patients to do that as well. Next is a pleasant sleep environment. So turning down the temperature to as cool as, as you can tolerate only using the room for two purposes, as they said in pharmacy school, sleep and sex, and, um, and to have it cool, and then if, if it's not dark, wear an eye mask. If it's not quiet, turn on a sound machine. There are lots of free sound machine apps, so making it as pleasant as possible. Then, we already talked about screen time. Finally, deep breathing. So back to the heart rate. It's important to have a slowed heart rate to be able to fall asleep. So you can tell your patients to do this technique that a sleep doctor recommended. It's called the four, six, seven technique. So they breathe in on four, so in, three, four, and then hold it for six counts. Four, five, six, 
and then out two, three, four, five, six, seven. And by doing that, it's slowing the respiratory rate, which forces the heart rate to slow as well. That allows them to fall asleep more restfully. Tylenol PM was our next option. So why in this patient should she not take it? She's otherwise young, so as far as the diphenhydramine, she's not an elderly patient who we need to avoid because of the beers list, but it does have the Tylenol, and Tylenol can cause drug-induced thrombocytopenia. So for her, she has ITP, we don't wanna do anything that would mess with her platelets, so let's avoid that option. So back to our question, has anybody changed their mind about their answer? But let's raise them up. What's the answer now, now that you know a little bit more? That's hilarious. Okay, the answer is C, better sleep hygiene. And why is that? Well, melatonin is an awesome option, but my dose is way too high. 25 milligrams is like, whoosh. they should start out at one to three milligrams. That would be a good dose. So I, I tricked you. Um, okay. Now, she's been on the prednisone for a while. She is experiencing weight gain. It's miserable, and she's got that round face. You can see it as she walks in to the pharmacy to pick up her next round of prednisone. And she says, what can I do about this? And she says, I've got this round face. Did you know that even my facial recognition software on my phone doesn't recognize me? Yeah, Apple doesn't even know who I am anymore. So there are only two options. You can either stop taking the drug or minimize the weight gain. Well, it's super hard to minimize the weight gain on prednisone because it's that fight or flight hormone and it's the sodium retention. So both of those, she needs to decrease the salt, the fat, and the sugar. That's not easy, but she also needs to increase her calcium and her vegetables to get all the nutrients that she needs that are being leached by the prednisone nutrient depletion. So now that you know another side effect she's complaining of, you can plug that one into the natural medicines database. And we see lots of options here. We see a whole bunch of different diets, DASH, Paleo, um, Atkins, and they all would probably work equally well for her because they're all high in vegetables and low in sugars. Um, there are other options on here that would not be good. Ephedra, she doesn't need any more stimulation. She's plenty stimulated. She doesn't need any of that. Caffeine, some other things that are interesting, aloe, calcium, they can potentially help with weight loss. So talking about calcium, she's now worried about her bones. Um, at doses over seven and a half milligrams, the bones are, start becoming leached of the calcium. And so that's when we need to get concerned about supplementation and the, the calcium is leached the most during the first three months, the rapid decline of the bone mass. How does osteoporosis happen when there's glucocorticoids? Now, glucocorticoids are naturally occurring in our body. We have a, a level that is endogenous and normal, and all of this that I'm about to tell you, the opposite happens when it's normal. But when there's too much, that's when we get these problems. So first, we're gonna talk about the gut. So normally, we absorb a lot of our calcium through our food. And when somebody is on prednisone, the diet, the um, absorption has changed. So there's not as, not as much calcium being absorbed. That leads to an increase in the PTH hormone. Then the kidneys, they are excreting calcium. So her body is even taking more calcium out in her urine. Oops. Then we have the gonads. So she's got less estrogen and progesterone, I mean, and progesterone, and in men, it will even less testosterone being released because glucocorticoids are very closely related to the sex hormones, and that whole cascade is being interfered with. So she's got less sex hormones, and those sex hormones increase her, the building of bone. And so if she's got less sex hormones, then there's less building of bone, the osteoblasts. Less of those are happening. Then muscles, when we do exercise and we use our muscles to run a marathon or whatever, it helps build up our bones because our body is trying to counteract the impact of all of that. But her muscles are being broken down instead of being built up. 
So that leads to osteoblast activity to decrease as well. So the combination of less osteoblasts and more osteoclasts, which are the breaking down cells in the bones, means she's got bone loss and low bone growth. The combination of those two things leads to osteoporosis. The American College of Rheumatology came up, out with some guidelines. The rheumatologists prescribe a lot of prednisone, especially for people with rheum uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And they said that all adults who are taking prednisone for a certain period of time and at a certain dose should have calcium supplementation so that they reach a daily dose of at least 1,000, if not 1,200 or 1,500 milligrams per day. So audience participation time. Get your cards ready. Which calcium supplementation routine should she do? Should she take calcium carbonate, which is the same thing as Tums, 500 milligrams twice a day? Or should she do Tums two tablets three times a day? Or should she do calcium citrate, which is the same thing as Citricol, 500 milligrams two tablets once a day? Or should she do calcium citrate, which is Citricol, 500 milligrams two tablets three times a day, A, B, or C? Awesome, we have a nice selection of options here. Let's find out which one it would be best. So in calcium, what we need to remember is that elemental calcium is the calcium ion that's being bound by the citrate or the carbonate. And for Tums, it's the calcium carbonate. And only 40% of the whole molecule is actually calcium. So when somebody takes 500 milligrams, it really only means they're taking 200 milligrams of calcium and 500 milligrams of calcium carbonate. So for a person taking Tums, they actually need five to six tablets of Tums per day. Then we have the Citricol, and it's only 21% elemental calcium. So why would we want to take it as opposed to the Tums? Well, it's actually better absorbed in people who have um, pH issues in their gut. So if they're on a proton pump inhibitor and it's um, interfering with their pH balance of their, of their stomach, then this one can still be absorbed, whereas it's hard to get the calcium carbonate absorbed in higher pH environments. So to actually get 1,200 milligrams of calcium, she needs nine to 11 tablets per day. That's a lot, especially considering she can't take them all at once because they won't be absorbed. Our bodies can only really absorb 500 milligrams at a time. So she'd have to spread those out throughout the day to get everything. But she wouldn't really need to take everything, right? Because theoretically, she's still eating food. And most food has at least some calcium. And if she's following one of those diets, then she's getting even more calcium through her diet. So other considerations for calcium supplementation include um, we need to take it with water, plenty of water to dilute out all of the ions and to take it separately from a high calcium meal. So it's not a great option to take it with your milk and your fortified cereal in the morning because the, the supplemental calcium isn't going to be absorbed very well. And then as pharmacists, we know all about these drug interactions, the calcium will either bind with these other drugs or it will um, interfere, they'll interfere with its absorption. Either way, they need to be taken at separate times. Which foods contain calcium? Well, we all know to drink your milk, right? That's not the only source of calcium. Leafy green vegetables are a really good source of calcium and uh, salmon, Nuts like cashews and almonds, broccoli, those all can contain calcium and are even actually higher in calcium than milk might be. So which calcium supplement? Now that you know a little bit more, which one should she choose? Which one should you recommend to your patient? So the answer is B, because that will get her the full 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. All right. Back to those guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology. These are some lifestyle modifications, or you can tell your patient these are natural ways 
to deal with side effects. So you can do weight-bearing exercises. Again, that helps the bone to feel like it needs to be built up. It, um, in balanced diet that we've just covered, that's really important. Maintaining the weight in a recommended range. It's pretty hard to have good bones when there's, there's too much to carry. And then limiting alcohol and smoking. Quitting smoking is, those can both affect the calcium balance. Back to the Natural Medicines database. They have a really cool tool that I enjoy called the Nutrient Depletion Tool. This tool, you can type in the name of the drug, and in this case, we typed in prednisone. And then you can find out which nutrients, such as calcium, are being depleted. So in this case, we find out calcium and vitamin D are both being depleted by the prednisone. When you click on the prednisone options, the calcium, you can see really great drug references down here. You can click on these hyperlinks, and you don't need to read this. What I want you to see is how much good information they have sourced. So that when your patient is wondering, will this work, you can say, yes, it will work because of all this good information. Another fancy tool that as pharmacists we might enjoy is the drug interaction tool. I didn't realize that there was this great tool available to find out which prescription drugs interact with which herbal remedies. So you can, when you are suggesting what could help this patient with her weight gain and her osteoporosis, you can say, well, melatonin can help and let me check if it interacts with any of your drugs. And so you can see it interacts with anticoagulants and anticonvulsants, but nope, don't see prednisone anywhere. No corticosteroids listed. So we're good, you can take it. On the Natural Medicines database, they have as many um, products listed as they can possibly catalog. There's so many coming out that maybe the most recent ones aren't in there, but they have many, many uh, cataloged products. So what they've done is they've created the number rating. So the natural medicine evidence-based rating, brand evidence-based rating, and it's objective. It helps us actually be able to say, this is a pretty good product because it, says, it does what it says it's supposed to do, or it has the ingredients that make sense for that reason they're taking it. Here's our next question. Which product should she use? Should she use the melatonin five milligrams by Up and Up, or should she use the melatonin three milligram fast dissolved strawberry flavor? A or B? Which one? B, okay, B, because the number rating is higher. It's nine as opposed to five. All right, a cool new app that just barely came out this summer is called Herblist. It sounds like a person who recommends herbs, an herbal list. And it's free. It was created by our government, the National Institutes of Health, and the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. We c you can download it onto your phone, or you can help your patient download it onto their phone. And you can search by herbs, and it has patient-friendly text to explain evidence-based information about those herbs. Here's an example of St. John's wort. As pharmacists, we've heard of it so many times as the main drug interaction, right? So what they've explained in great text is, it has been clearly shown that St. John's wort can interact in dangerous and sometimes life-threatening ways with a variety of medicines. We know that, but they might not. So this is a great way to support what you're saying. Hey, you're on this new medicine. It can potentially interfere with some herbs. Are you taking St. John's wort? Here, this is why, and you can have them download it and pull it up on their phone. Now, this question is, which of these four drugs cause nutrient depletion? Does geodon cause nutrient depletion? Does metformin, does Tratera, or does propranolol? Okay, I love it. Got lots of options. So, the pharmacist's letter came out with a chart, like hundreds of lines long, of all the possible ways that dr drugs can deplete different nutrients. It has everything from cancer drugs down to oral drugs that we commonly dispense in a community pharmacy. I limited it to only the clinically relevant ones for oral drugs. 
So first of all, we're going to talk about fluoroquinolone and tetracycline antibiotics. As we know, they bind up several nutrients, especially those ions, the iron, magnesium, and zinc, and calcium. And so um, on our chart, you can see the name of the drug, the nutrients that are depleted, and if you don't know what they are, at the bottom, that's the name of each nutrient, and how it works. Finally, whether or not we actually need to supplement that, whether that drug needs um, the vitamins or the other nutrient that's being depleted, whether we need to give it as a supplement to replace what's been lost. So for the tetracycline and fluoroquinolone antibiotics, it all depends on the timing of the dose. We don't necessarily need to supplement that, we just need to carefully explain to our patients to take them separately. Then we have methotrexate, and methotrexate is a folate antagonist, so it causes fol folic acid depletion. Now we should supplement this for patients who are taking it for a non-cancer thing. So the rheumatologist will often prescribe the folic acid one milligram to go along with it or whatever dose. And that makes sense, but we don't wanna recommend this to somebody who is taking methotrexate for cancer because it might interfere with the efficacy of the methotrexate. Then we have metformin. Now metformin, as our previous speaker said, is like Tylenol. It's, the best drug for diabetes, but it does have some nutrient depletion. It can affect the folic acid and vitamin B12 and B1. And so should it be supplemented? Well, it probably should be. Their primary care physician, or if you have a great collaborative practice agreement, you could order labs. They need to be following to make sure that they have enough B12. And if they don't, it should be supplemented. Then we have digoxin, and the renal excretion of magnesium is a problem. So should we supplement it? Yes, if we're following those labs again. Uh, the statins, now this one's controversial. Should we supplement coenzyme Q10 when somebody's taking statin? The evidence goes both ways. Does it help with statin myopathy? Maybe. Does um, it really deplete coenzyme Q10? Maybe. The evidence is conflicting. So if you have a patient who's struggling to be adherent to their statin because of myopathy, then it couldn't hurt to suggest the coenzyme Q10 supplementation. And the great benefit of all of this is your Penny's prescription of prednisone or metformin or um, uh, the, the, the statins. You're only making a few pennies on it. Now you can add in these other alternatives to make more money on your transaction, right? So then loop and thiazide diuretics, they both cause the body to excrete lots of urine, including lots of electrolytes. So often potassium sparing diuretics are given in conjunction to prevent a lot of that depletion, but other uh, electrolytes are being depleted. They can be supplemented. Then we have our immunosuppressants, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and they affect magnesium through the renal reabsorption. At the bottom here, we're talking about the anti-seizure drugs, the old ones, the anticonvulsants. These are carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, and valproic acid. As we all know, they have lots of drug interactions. And not only just drug interactions, they have lots of vitamin interactions. Because of the way they're affecting the cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver, it, it can interfere with how the vitamins are broken down or whether they're even absorbed. So there should definitely be supplementation for patients who are on these drugs. On this chart, we start with the PPIs. We've kind of already talked about PPIs, that they decrease the acidity of the, of the stomach. And so drugs, I mean, vitamins that are absorbed when there's a low acid environment are poorly absorbed. So they can be uh, supplemented. And then the, the iron is because people who are on PPIs often also have a GI bleed. And so if they have a GI bleed, obviously they're becoming anemic and should have iron supplementation. Then we have our corticosteroids. We've already talked pretty in depth about our prednisone and we'll skip to the estrogens and oral contraceptive pills. I learned in pharmacy school all about why we need to take prenatals for childbearing women who are trying to get pregnant. What I didn't realize is that if a woman's childbearing, she's either pregnant or breastfeeding, she is being depleted by her, her baby, but if she's taking oral contraceptive pill, 
those almost the same nutrients are being depleted. So unless she's um, either not sexually active or not using any form of birth control for another reason, every situation during the childbearing years indicate using a prenatal vitamin. So you can suggest that to all women in that age range. Then sulfasalazine. It depletes folic acid because it blocks the absorption, and so when they're on a high dose of that, then they should be supplemented. NSAIDs ca can cause a GI bleed, and only in that case would you supplement. Otherwise, they don't need supplementation. Then we have Orlistat, which is Xenical or Ally, the weight loss drug. It works by blocking fat absorption, and so it also blocks the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. Those need to be supplemented. Then isoniazid and rifampin, those are not as frequently dispensed, but they do deplete nutrients. And what's interesting is that if isoniazid is given with rifampin, then it prevents those nutrients depleted by rifampin from being depleted. So they are synergistic when they're given together. So now that you've got more information, what is the answer to this question? A, B, C, or D? Metformin, yes, that is our answer, metformin. And that is such a frequently prescribed drug, you can suggest supplementation and make a few more dollars on your prescription. So, if you didn't get all of the hints I dropped throughout the presentation, that patient with ITP is me. What you can't see in this picture of my bleeding um, needle prick from my CBC blood draw is the blood on the floor, it's dripping. When this picture was taken, it was the last day I could rely on prednisone. It was no longer working to keep my platelets up. It, the platelets still crashed even on high doses. So I was dealing with all of those side effects and more. So I had to go to an alternative treatment. And I, I went on rituximab, $40,000 chemotherapy. All those interesting precautions that we had to learn about in our earlier course, they had to take for me because it interferes with um, it, it can cause birth defects. So I had to go in and get an infusion once a week for four weeks, I had to be careful being around sick people, and it worked. I am currently with a normal platelet level, and the good news is at my appointment with my hematologist a few weeks ago, she said I got to graduate from once a week blood draws to once a month blood draws. Hurrah. I am now <laughs> officially a more normal person. Um, what did we cover today? So what are you going to do with the information that you learned today? Are you going to improve your motivational te interviewing technique? Are you going to have one phrase that you're going to ask every patient you talk to? How is this working for you? Are you going to improve your own sleep hygiene so that when you are in the pharmacy, you're at the top of your game with enough sleep? Are you going to help patients with weight gain? Or are you gonna lose weight yourself? Are you going to find more guidelines to learn about? Are you going to follow evidence-based medicine? Are you going to find out how to log in to the natural medicines database? Or are you going to download the Herblist app onto your phone? What are you going to do today? What questions do you have? 